Hey guys, it's Kevin again, finally here to review the first season of Chucky. And so what this show is basically about is we uh, basically focus on a bunch of different storylines, but our main one concerns the character of Jake. He is this uh, teenager of sorts who is kind of in a time in his life where, you know, he doesn't really have many friends. He's kind of an outcast in that way. He, But he also is very much still trying to, you know, discover himself and whatnot. And one day during this yard sale, he happens upon this uh, good guy doll, which of course eventually turns out to be uh, Chucky. And pretty much what starts off as like this really nice idyllic town in New Jersey quickly does turn to chaos as these murders start to pile up all around the town, and meanwhile we see a bunch of characters from Chucky's past also turn up uh, in a feat of revenge, which also starts to expose a lot of what's actually um, at the center of everything. So, Chucky Season 1. I, look, I was planning on originally doing this as a uh, weekly um, series. I was going to cover this show weekly with a friend of mine. Uh, it just never really worked out. I wasn't able to stay up to date with the show and then there were other things that happened and it just it, unfortunately we were not able to do it together um so what I decided to do instead is before I and, and you know initially I was going to review this before I left for Canada I uh started watching the rest of the show and it worked out perfectly because literally right before I left is when the rest of the first season went on to uh Peacock so it worked out perfectly for me I just didn't get it done in time and unfortunately I wasn't able to get it done until now there's a lot of things I wanted to do before I went to Canada, but that's that's a whole other discussion. It's fine. I've got done some of the stuff I want to get done, but not quite everything. Um, but either way, I was very excited for this series. In fact, it was one of my most anticipated uh, of the entire um, rest of 2021, mainly because of the fact that I feel Chucky as a horror franchise is one of the only horror franchises that honestly has been getting better with time rather than being in decline like a lot of them and I think it's especially because you know it's never really lost that vision that it had all the way back in the 80s from Don Mancini he's always been at the helm he's always been in control of this character and that's always been amazing to see um and with this series I was just really excited to see what he was really going to do there's a lot more that he can you know explain expound upon that he introduced in the original series and he can really kind of dive deeper into that here so how is this really going to turn out to be honest I was pretty blown away uh, by this series even though I was very excited for it Chucky is a much different show than I really was expecting yes it's a lot of fun yes it can be very horrifying at times but it has this sense of heart and authenticity to it that I, I really wasn't expecting and what we get is nothing short of I think the best thing we have ever gotten um, in terms of this character, but we are just getting into right now, starting off with the cast here. This is the one thing that I think I was most impressed by, is that Look, a lot of these films that Chucky has been involved with have not had the greatest acting. Even some of the better entries, I don't think the acting has really been all that strong. Surprisingly, though, everyone really kills it in this film. I don't think there's a single bad performance in the bunch here. I really was impressed by everyone. I think everyone really does kill it. Specifically, though, Zachary Arthur, who plays our main character, uh, Jake Wheeler, was just incredible in this show. Not only does he do a really great job of diving into the insecurity of someone like Jake, someone who a lot of people don't take him seriously. He is, you know, very poor in that way. He doesn't really have the best, um, you know, living environment. Um, and you can see how this has really gone to him, but you also see that Jake is someone that is also very conflicted because that when he comes across Chucky, there is this very interesting, you know, sort of bond that forms uh, with him. And I really liked what they end up doing with Jake as a character. This is a character that really is put through the ringer this season. I mean, there is so much that he goes through here, and uh, it really challenges Arthur to really dive deep into just the emotional baggage that this character goes through, and he kills it in this show, especially in the, I would say, back half of this season. I think that's really when his acting really did show. I think that he is such a likable lead, but he's also someone you're so compelled by, and I think, you know, Arthur's performance performance makes Jake that much better of a character, and I, I really loved what he ended up doing here. I think it was not an easy role to pull off. This is not a 
a one note one note character in really any way. There's a lot of facets to him, and I, I really loved what Arthur ended up doing here. I think he did an amazing job. Uh, but Jorvin Harnison as well, though, as Devin, I thought was also really well done. He very much, I would say, is the heart of the show. Um, he is someone that is very compassionate, but he also is very much obsessed with uh, serial killers. This is something that he has done extensive research about, and I thought that he did a really great job when it came to that performance. I feel like this is a character that, if you play him wrong, could get very annoying because he is so obsessed with, like you know, murders and things like that, but I think Arnison did a really good job of really grounding this character in reality, and I think he is uh, really great in the show, and there's a really good chemistry between him and Zachary Arthur. The bond that these two form, I think, is one of the best parts of the entire show. I think that both of them have such incredible chemistry. The romance is really something that is looming throughout this entire first season, and you really do get attached to both of it, and a large testament is because of the chemistry between uh, Arthur and Anderson. I think both of them just work so well together, and I think that's definitely, I would go as far as to say, is really the heart of the show overall. It really blossoms into something special, and I, I really did enjoy uh, what they ended up doing with these two. I gotta say, though, for me, the best performance, and the one that really, like, surprised me, I gotta say, though, for me, the best performance, and the one that really, like, surprised me the most with how good it was, was Olivia Allen Lind, who played Lexi. She starts off, and you think she really is just kind of like the stereotypical mean girl. I mean, she is just so cruel to Jake and pretty much anyone that she comes across. She's like the overachiever. Everyone loves her. You know, she is uh, this girl that everyone feels is just perfect and things like that. But there is a lot more going on with Lexi besides that. And Lynn really does do what she can to make you kind of empathize with this character. I, I wouldn't say that Lexi is someone that everyone is going to love, but by the end of the series, I really did find myself connecting with her. I think Lexi is probably one of the best characters of this entire show. She by far goes through the most character development, and I really loved what Lind ended up doing here. I think her performance was very strong in this show. Similar to Jake, there's a lot that this character goes through, and Lind really does leave it all out on the table, and I really liked her performance here. And I think, like I said, these three really do work so well together. You really do get a lot of scenes of these three, and I thought they all did an incredible job, and I, I really did enjoy their bond here. Uh, Tio Briones also plays a very interesting role in this as the character of Junior. This is Jake's cousin, who he's very much a mystery in this show. You don't really know what's going on with him. He uh, is someone that always wants to know what's going on at all times, and he's also so paranoid in that way and you really see what drives this character. This is another character that I feel could be very over the top if not handled well, but Briones really did a good job of making this feel believable, and I, I really liked what they did with them. There's some directions they went with this character that I really was not expecting, but I think it really did work, and that's because of how good his performance really was here. Uh, like I said, I think all of the kids really do an amazing job in this show. These are all really great actors, and I, I look forward to seeing them them, not just, you know, reprise their roles as these characters, because, you know, this show was renewed for a season two, so obviously we are going to see some of these characters again, um, but I'm also just excited to see what they do in future roles, because I really do think that every single one of these actors have a big future ahead of them, and I can't wait to see what else they do uh, in the coming years. Now, as far as the rest of the cast goes, I think everyone does a really great job. Lexa Doig gave a heartbreaking performance as the character of Bree. This is Jake's aunt, someone that you can see throughout the show kind of has this secret, and when it eventually comes out, it just absolutely wrecks you once you realize what's going on. I thought she did a really great job. Barbara Allen Woods and Michael Theriault had a lot more to do than I expected. They play Lexi's parents, and there's a lot of depth given to those characters. I'll get more into that with the writing, but I thought they did a really good job. And then, of course, we got the legacy characters, which, of course, do pop up in this show. And I have to say, as much as I have enjoyed, um, you know, uh, the work that this actress has done, I don't think we've seen a better performance from Fiona Durth than 
we have in this show. I mean, she is given so much to do here, so much more than you would expect for her to do, and my god, does she kill it. Obviously, after the events of Cult of Chucky, you expect for her to play a pretty integral role in the show, but what they ended up doing with her um, was far more challenging than I expected, and I think she just absolutely nailed every second of what she was doing here. I was so impressed by her performance, without a doubt one of the best performances uh, within this entire season. I, I love what she ended up doing here. Jennifer Tilly is always great as Tiffany. She's always so fun to watch, and they do some really fun stuff when it came to that character, and I, I liked what they ultimately did end up uh, doing with her. And of course, Alex Vincent and Christina Lee do show up as well, and they're good for what they have. But then it comes down to Brad Dourif, who plays Chucky, and I have to say, this might just be his best performance as the character yet, mainly because we get a far more fleshed out portrayal of Chucky than we really ever have. Like, yes, we know some of what he's been up to, but here... This really is the most full-fledged, full-fleshed-out, three-dimensional version of Chucky we've ever gotten, and because of that, Durr's performance is that much better as a result. Yes, the wisecracks are there. Yes, the demented side of this character is always going to be there. It's always fun to watch him just have all these, like, fun one-liners and things like that, but they do some really interesting things with Chucky that I don't think Durif has really ever done before. We get to see a lot more of Chucky not just be on this murderous rampage because obviously yeah he does do a lot of killing but there's a lot more going on with Chucky story wise than I think people are going to be expecting and I really loved what they ended up doing uh, with him in the show I think it's just amazing to me how much Durif is still into this character how much he still loves playing this character because it could be so easy for him to just half ass it at this point and he really never does and like I said I think maybe gives his finest work yet everyone really does kill it in the show like I said I don't think there's a single week performance in the entire bunch. I think even Karina London Batrick, who plays the younger sister of Lexi, didn't really have to do a lot as Caroline, but she really does sell the uh, innocence of and the naivety of this character, I think, very well overall. Uh, everyone really does kill them in terms of acting, and it's without a doubt one of the best parts of the show. Now, let's get into the stuff that I think is really going to surprise a lot of people. The directing in this show. Now, obviously, yes, this show has a lot, like I said, of horrifying moments to it. Uh, at points, it is very much funny to watch. There are a lot of silly things that do happen throughout this show. But what I think is so surprising here is that it is peppered with this really genuine sense of heart and emotion that really gets us a lot more into this story than you would expect. This really does feel like this is what Don Mancini has always wanted to do with this property, but he just has never really had the avenue to do so, and what an amazing feat that he was actually able to find the right place to do that. What he's able to do here with this show, like I said, is really just flesh out a lot of these things a lot more. A lot of the themes that he's trying to go for, it just feels that much more dived into here. Nothing feels short-changed in this show. Nothing feels unexplored. Everything really does feel just a lot more fulfilling and I think it's just due to the vision that Mancini has always had. You know, he's gone as far as to say this is probably his most personal work to date, and it's understandable why. You know, Jake as a character is someone who is kind of struggling with his sexuality. He knows he's gay, but a lot of people don't really take him seriously, and it, it very much does seem like Jake is sort of like a mirror of Don Mancini in that way, of how he was as a child, and I think it's that's really special. That's really profound, and it really does come through when it comes to his directing. I honestly think there were moments in the show that were really emotional. There were moments that had me almost on the verge of tears. I was honestly really surprised by how much he did that, but he did just as good of a job with that as he does with the horror, as he does with the more, you know, dark comedy moments. He does such a good job with everything, just really putting his heart and soul into the show and my God, does it pay off? And no, he's not always directing uh, every single episode. In fact, he only directs the uh, first episode. The rest of them, most of them, he ends up writing. Um, but you can tell that it is his vision through and through. This is really what he's always wanted to accomplish with this character. But like I said, he's just never had the right opportunity to. And now he finally does. It's just so amazing to watch, see a creator really get to see their vision through in the way they've always wanted to. It's just such a beautiful 
beautiful thing to watch, and it's he just did such an amazing job, I think, of helming the show. Don Mancini has always been someone I respect because he takes a lot of chances, he goes in weird directions, but he also is a fan himself, and he always is willing to listen to critical reception, but he doesn't try to retcon anything that happened, he tries to make it better, and he absolutely exceeds at doing that here. Here, I really do see him as one of the true masters when it comes to horror working today, and it's just amazing to me that he was able to pull this off. But let's get into the writing with the show, because the thing that really impresses me when it comes to Chucky is that this obviously is based off a popular slasher property, and what they could easily do is just focus on the nostalgia and try to cater to, you know, everyone that grew up with the show, fans of the franchise, you know, do whatever you can to get them to do that. And they do that to an extent, you know, by bringing in legacy characters, by diving deeper into Chucky's past. They, they do that for sure, but what they do an even better job with is that at the end of the day, while there are a lot of things going on in the show plot-wise, and there, there is a lot going on, especially once you get to, I would say, the fifth episode of the show, that's really when you start to realize just how much is really happening here. There's a lot that we're dealing with in this show in terms of storylines. Um... They, the show really does put its characters front and center and puts the most emphasis into them. And that was something that was just amazing to watch because, like I said, while I've enjoyed this franchise, I wouldn't always say they've had the most, like, complex of characters. Uh, I would say... But prior to this, Nika was really the best character for me because I felt like she was the most well-written. They got into, you know, her trauma affiliated with Chucky, her mission to take him down, how he really has just ruined her entire life in that way. But even Nika does not have that much development when you compare her to, say, Jake in this show, who by far is the best character we have ever gotten uh, within Chucky. He is without a doubt the most fleshed out. He is without a doubt the most three-dimensional, and I'm so happy about that because it's so easy to write Jake as just a typical teenager who doesn't want Chucky because he's outgrown Chucky and he just wants to get away from him, but then Chucky just starts murdering people and that starts, you know, um, that, that starts to make Jake a little more interested in what's going on. He starts to become a little bit more fearful of what's happening. He becomes a lot more, ad, you know, he becomes a lot more adamant on getting this doll out of there, but there's so much more going on with Jake besides that. We get a lot into his home life, the abuse that he has to deal with when it comes to his father, which Devin Sawa is amazing in this show, let me just say. I know I already talked about the acting, but Devin Sawa is incredible here and really dives deep into some of the, um, struggles that Jake is going through, the way that he is constantly picked on in school. It's not the type of bullying you normally see. It goes really far, and there's a lot of stuff that is very fucked up in terms of the bullying, and you're just kind of like, oh my god, how, why would somebody take it this far? But it makes sense when it comes to Jake as a character, why he would go through this incessant trauma, and the connection that he has with Chucky was not necessarily what I was expecting. In a way, Chucky sort of is like this trusted companion to him, trying to push Jake to his limits, to that darker side, and you're really unsure where Jake is going to go. Is Jake going to go down a heroic path, or is he going to become this more darker version of himself? You're not really sure what's going to happen because we've kind of seen it played out both ways where, you know, Andy's someone who, yes, his life was very much ruined by Chucky, but he's sort of this vigilante now that's murdering dolls like left and right. And then the flip side, you have Nika, someone who is paraplegic and yet hasn't been able to do a ton and a lot of people see her as like this maniac but she really is like the most sane out of everyone she wants to do everything she can to like warn people of Chucky Jake kind of is I think the perfect blend of those two characters and I, I really loved what they ended up doing with him overall and especially when it comes to the end of the season and you know we eventually see the choice that Jake make Jake makes it's that much more fulfilling and 
I think they did a really good job when it came to him, but it's not just Jake's character that has a lot to do. Like I said, Lexi as a character is far more fleshed out than I expected. I mean, the beginning of the show, I didn't like her at all. I thought she was just the typical mean girl. They weren't really going to do much of anything with her, but they really dive deep into what makes her this way. Why does Lexi treat Jake in the way she does, and does that kind of reflect the way her parents treat her? We kind of see, you know, some of the ways she's treated at home, this way where she has to act a certain way, she has to look a certain way. There's a, a great expectation that people have for her, and you can kind of see how this starts to get to her, and Lexi really does go through a lot of development this season that, like I said, I think by the end of the show, she's without a doubt one of the best characters um, within the entire Chucky franchise, and I, I really loved what they ended up doing with her. Junior, as well, gets a lot of development. Even the parents in the show, these are not just, like, parents who don't believe their kids as to what's going on. Like, yeah, we've seen that trope done a thousand times, but this show really dives deep into some of the distractions uh, from these characters. You know, what's really keeping them away from believing all of this? What are their struggles that they're dealing with? We really do dive deep into that, whether it's marital problems between uh, Lexi's parents or Lexi's mother, who has all of this pressure on her because she's trying to be both the perfect mom and the perfect mayor and clearly is flawed in both areas, and you really do kind of see her kind of uh, come to grips with that in this show. Uh, or whether it's the character of Bree, who is Jake's aunt, who always has the best of intentions, but seems to be uh, becoming more and more distant from her family because of this secret that's nagging at her, and you start to realize, you know, what's really going on there. Or Devin Sawa's character, who he plays two characters in the show. One of them is uh, Lucas, who, like I said, is Jake's very abusive father, but never, even he doesn't feel one note. Like, you understand why Lucas is acting this way. You don't condone his behavior or anything like that, obviously, but you understand why he treats Jake this way. You understand why he feels this is the way to go about it, and I, I think they just did such an amazing job with that, and then contrasting that with Logan, who wants to do everything he can to not be like his brother. I mean, you have some insanely compelling characters going on here, and that's something that I was just not expecting in the show. I was expecting them to dive into some topics a little more, but not to the extent that they do here, and it's honestly incredible to see a lot of the character development, the way this show tackles things like bullying, uh, you know, uh, domestic violence, uh, sexuality, you know, all of those things are dived into in a really interesting light, and... And then right in the center of it, you have Chucky, who, like I said, is the most fleshed out he really has ever been uh, within this show. And thank God, honestly, because while I've always enjoyed watching Chucky, there's a lot of things we haven't known. We don't know why he's become this way. And the show does get into this origin story of sorts, and it, it doesn't feel like it's something we didn't need. On the surface, it's kind of like, do we really need this? Do we really need to see how Chucky became this killer? Do we really need to see how Chucky ended up becoming the way he did, but it really gets you to understand this character better. Some of the behaviors that he ends up um, having in this show are a lot more clear now. Why does he act a certain way? Why is he so adamant about certain things? Even some of the catchphrases that he says, they have a much deeper meaning to it, and I really love that. I think Chucky as a character um, is so much more compelling now because now you understand his mission a lot more. You understand what he really wants to do, what attracted him to this lifestyle. You know, This show really does dive deep into that, uh, whether it's him as a child, his relationship with Tim, all of that is just so much more fleshed out here, and thank God, because I, I really do think it's the best that we've ever seen it within this show. And then the legacy characters. Now, I will say, you do have to wait a little bit for them to show up. They don't show up until the fifth episode of the show. But I will say, for what we get with them, I was not disappointed in the slightest. They really do a good job, I think, of trying to um, make this feel like a culmination of what kind of started up in Cult of Chucky than anything. Um, but also, again, fleshing out these characters in more ways than they really could, because they just have a lot more time to do that. And I think that this really is the right avenue for this show moving forward. Like, if I really had to 
make a decision as to whether or not I want to see a show or movies, if like Damian Cini has to make that choice, this is definitely the route to go. Because as much as I've enjoyed the movies that he's been making, I think that there's just a lot more that he can do in a TV show. There's a lot more he can get into here. And seeing what he was able to accomplish here, I can't even imagine what we're going to get into next. And I, I really loved uh, everything in terms of the writing in the show, the dialogue there. There's still some really gruesome killing don't get me wrong, but they're not quite as consistent as, as you expect them to. It actually does take a while to get to those killings because, again, the focus of the show is the characters, and I think overall the show is that much better because of it. And Devin is a character as well. You know, yes, we established from the beginning that Jake has a crush on him, and there clearly is, you know, from the beginning, I think you can tell there's some sort of mutual feeling there, but Devin isn't just Jake's boyfriend. He has his own character. He has his own stuff that he's dealing with. And you really do dive deep into that character a little bit. You know, why is he obsessed with true crime and things like that? Uh, and I, I think they did some really good work when it came to that character. And like I said, I think their relationship really is like the heart and soul of this entire show. You really do find yourself getting so wrapped up in them. And I was honestly surprised by how wrapped up I was getting into some of these stories lines. It wasn't just about, you know, who's going to die next. You kind of forget that these characters are eventually going to die. Um, you care just a lot more about their individual journeys. And when something happens that kind of ruins those journeys, I mean, it's that much more devastating. So while the killings are like really gruesome to watch and they're really fun to watch, they kind of have this more like emotional touch to them that it's just really makes it that much more satisfying to watch. There were a lot of deaths in, and this isn't just a play of the Chucky series, but slasher movies in general, that you have characters that die and I don't feel connected to them. I can't really say that with this show. Most of the characters that died here, I felt connected to. I felt like they did a good job in getting us to understand them. And when eventually they would pull off those deaths, it is all the more devastating. And I, I really liked what they ended up doing there. So overall, I think through and through, the writing was just absolutely spectacular when it came to the show. The cinematography is fantastic here. You're worried that maybe it's going to be lowered, the budget's going to be lowered a bit because of TV. If anything, I think it's increased. This is easily the best I think Chucky has looked in a long time. The look and feel of him, he just looks so tangible. Like, this looks like a doll that you would just see in, like, a toy store, and you would just order it not knowing, you know, the sinister intentions behind it. Um, and I think they did a really great job of that because it shows why people are so susceptible into believing this doll. Because obviously, we know there's a lot more good guy dolls out there, obviously from the end of Cult of Chucky. We know that's going on. But it's how they really tie that in. I thought they did a good job in the look and feel of uh, each good guy doll. I thought just worked really well in this show. Um but just the look and feel of everything, honestly, it feels a lot grander uh, in terms of that because, again, they have that budget. There's so much more they're able to do. And I think what it really does come down to is with those movies, a lot of them are fairly cheap. You can tell that they didn't have the biggest budget. This time around, they do, and they really do go all out when it comes to that. And I, I just loved what they did with the cinematography. Some of the stuff they do, the flashbacks are in a completely different filter and like aspect ratio. And I thought that was a really like clever touch that they ended up doing. So I really enjoyed the cinematography a lot here. The score that Joseph De uh, Loduca composed was also really great. I, I love the intro to the show as well. I think just in general, the music was really strong here. And the editing. This show is eight episodes long, and I think that was definitely the right amount. I found myself uh, very much riveted by this show. I binged it pretty quickly. The first two episodes obviously took me a little bit to watch them, but once I got to episode three, I pretty much finished this entire thing in almost a day. And it's just, again, because of how well-paced I think the show is. But then also, like I said, there's a lot going on here. We're actually dealing with essentially three different shows, and in no point does it feel too overly convoluted. It just feels like something that organically fit into the narrative. And when it all comes together, it just was the perfect blend of both the old and the new. And so I think they did a really great job with that. Like I said, there are there is nostalgia in there. There is a lot of stuff you're going to to recognize if you're a Chucky fan, but I think they gave just enough time to the new characters as they did to the old, and I, I was overall very satisfied when it came to uh, the way the show was edited. 
And in terms of the way they wrap up this first season, like I said, going into this, I, I didn't know if this was going to be a first season or like a limited series. I kind of thought it was going to be a limited series at first, but obviously they got that second season and it's deserving. The way they leave things off, there is a lot more that they can dive into. There's a lot more, um, you know, conflict going on when it comes to these characters. And there's a lot more mileage I think they can get out uh, with uh, these characters as well that they even don't dive quite as deep to in here. So I'm very excited to see, you know, Know, what they end up doing with everyone moving forward and I think that's gonna make the show that much better overall all right so now I do want to go ahead and get into the spoilers which my god where do we begin with this show there is a lot to talk about this is a very eventful first season and let me just say like starting off I didn't think I th figured that would be the case, but what I think this show did a really good job with is the first four episodes are relatively slow paced. There's a lot going on, but not in the sense where it's like, oh my god, so many events happen. Like, in the, the, the last three episodes in particular are just insane, and it's not like the rest of the episodes aren't, but what I think they do a good job with is the first few episodes keep things relatively simplistic. We're mainly focusing on Jake and uh, his eventual friends and things like that. And I thought they did a good job of developing that narrative, whether it was, you know, seeing in the beginning with Jake and him wanting to be this artist of sorts and kind of being frowned upon by his father, which that was a really interesting direction they took it in. I thought his father was just going to be like kind of just the homophobic sort of emotionally abusive father, but there was a lot more to him than that. You understand why he is that way because his son, you know, he doesn't believe that the kind of uh, career that his son wants is one that will take him far, contrasting that with his career where he really is just this janitor all his life. He's never really had any kind of success and so you understand why he is the way he is. You understand why he is so hard on everyone, why he is just so bitter and angry all the time. And again, Devin Sawa did such a good job with uh, the character of Lucas and really kind of grounding him. Um, and they do a good job of like, at first, making you, you know, making him be someone that you want to be killed. So when Chucky kills him, like, at first, you're like, oh my god, we don't have to deal with this character anymore, what a relief. But then, as that time goes on, I think they do a good job of showing that there was an avenue in which him and his son could have worked things out. And you can see, while at first, Jake is kind of uh, taken aback by what Chucky did, he's also kind of relieved over what happened, he realizes that there was an opportunity to mend things with his father. And I think I think that was a sign that like the, a lot of these characters that we're going to get attached to are going to go the same way, but I just didn't really expect for them to kill as many characters as they really did, and for a while, they don't. It's very focused after that on Jake and him kind of recovering from this, settling into an environment where he's now living with Junior and Bree and Logan, and you can see that Junior really doesn't want much to do with Jake, although he is trying to protect Jake, the two of them just don't really get along at all. Junior is very, like, standoffish offish in that way. He's got a very complicated relationship with Lexi where, um, you know, while they're in a place where you can see there is some physical intimacy between them, uh, even though they're kind of struggling with that as well, you can see that they're just having a very, like, uh, complicated relationship, and I thought they portrayed that uh, pretty well overall, and I was impressed by the way that turned out. Um, and I think what, and, you know, slowly getting into him, eventually getting to a point where now Chucky's trying to convince him to kill Lexi, and I love the idea that that Chucky was sort of this like devil on his shoulder like he was the one nagging him he was the one kind of telling him what to do um he was trying to push Jake to his limits in that way I thought that was such a cool idea because we've kind of seen that sort of explored in the movies like they tried to do it with Tyler and Child's Play 3 it really didn't work they've tried to do it with some other characters uh it just never really worked out here I feel like this is the first time where it actually 
really did work because we get to see that Chucky is coming across as someone that is going to help them. He's a means to fix the problems in their life when really they are just his accomplice in that way and they're going to take the fall for his wrongdoings and that's his entire goal. And I think seeing those flashbacks especially, you know, tied into that very well, which I'll get into obviously, but I really like where they go with Jake where at first he does kind of think about killing Lexi, but he just doesn't have that right moment. But eventually it comes to a point where him and Lexi do have to team up because Chucky gets close to killing her, burns her house down, um... And this point, they do kind of, like, work things out. Lexi generally apologizes for what she did. She realizes that Jake wasn't the one that was, um, you know, uh, throwing all those insults at her at, like, the uh, assembly and whatnot at the talent show. And she apologized for that. It was a really good moment between these two. And I really liked how much Lexi changes within these episodes to the point where at the end of the season, she considers Jake a part of her family. She considers Jake as someone that she can depend upon during emotional situations and he feels the same way about her. I just, I really liked that friendship a lot. It was very unexpected where they took that character, especially in season one, but I really liked what they end up doing with her. And then Devin is a character as well. I like that we ultimately see that he is just this really sensitive guy. He wants to help people out. He has this love, for, you know, he has this obsession with crime. He has this obsession with like serial killers and things like that. But at the end of the day, he wants what's best for Jake. And I think they did a good job at developing uh, those three characters a lot. And so you're really attached to the story. Junior is pretty much left out of all of this, meanwhile. And I think that really sets up that second half well. So once we get to the second half of the season, they start to introduce the legacy characters more. You know, you're that much more taken aback with the directions that this ends up going. I mean, um, obviously, we knew Chucky was not going to die in episode four. But I have to say, maybe my favorite moment of the entire season is what Chucky pulls off when they think he's dead and, you know, it's, uh, Jake finds that doll. The doll turns out to just kind of be a dud, um, but it keeps Lexi's younger sister, who has become so attached to Chucky to the point where he's not there. She's, like, throwing th full-on temper tantrums when Chucky isn't, um, you know, uh, in her possession. Um, you know, she's, like, freaking out about it. Um it gets to a point where Chucky somehow pulled off this switcheroo where before he ended up, you know, he was burnt to a, he was, half of his face was burnt. He didn't like his appearance and the way he wanted to sort of reinvent himself is to put his soul into the Chucky doll. And we see the principles about to like make a speech. Her head just like rolls out of the curtain. That for me was like the moment where I'm like, I fucking love this show. I love what the show is doing. I love how they're slowly getting more violent every episode uh, and it just perfectly set up that's those last three episodes of the season where things are just insane. You don't know what Chucky is going to do. You don't know what he's going to pull off here. And what he ends up pulling off was insane to me. Um, I mean, easily the saddest death was, without a doubt, Breeze. I was so devastated uh, that they ended up killing her off, especially because, like, we find out in episode five that she's been keeping this secret all season. We think maybe it's something, like, sinister or something that like she should be ashamed of. Turns out she has stage four cancer, and she's, like very close to dying and she got to a point where she was like ready to sort of just like settle and like enjoy the moments that she came with her family and right when she's at that point that's when Chucky pushes her out the window and it was just uh it was it was so heartbreaking to watch and that's not something that I normally say about something like this like yeah I'd say that was a cool kill yeah that was a really satisfying kill but heartbreaking not usually an adjective I would use. And the fact that this show was able to pull off something that emotional, uh, I am just so impressed by it. And they did such an amazing job when it came to Brie as a character. And that perfectly transitions us into Junior's darker turn, where he starts to kind of go down this path and he starts to realize, you know, he starts to blame himself for what happened. And while all season Chucky has... Un, you know, been unconvincing with his darker methods and trying to turn these kids into killers, he finally is able to do so with Junior. And it's a direction I didn't expect, but I really should have, because the directions they were going with Junior, he was getting more and more increasingly annoyed and angry as the season goes on, because he didn't have those answers. He didn't know what was going on. Nobody was telling him anything. He felt so disconnected from 
every event that was happening, it made sense that eventually got to a boiling point where he straight up kills his father. Like, this is not Chucky's doing. Chucky coerces him into doing it, but Junior's the one that commits the act, and it was so horrifying to watch, that moment where you can see Logan is not necessarily doing the best at parenting Junior. He's very hard on him, especially when it comes to, like, athletics and things like that. But again, it's also because he doesn't want to turn out like Lucas, who kind of turned out to be this loser of sorts. You know, he wants to be the brother that's looked at in a more positive light, and you can see that that's something that he's very insecure about, and I think that is what ultimately did kill Logan. But, I mean, Junior just coming in there and, like, you know, killing him with the doll. What a creative kill that was, too. Like, literally using the doll as, like, a murder weapon I thought was such an interesting way of killing him, but it was so gruesome to watch, and I was not expecting him to die there either, because, you know, they already killed one half of Devon Sawa. I didn't think they killed the other half, and they did, and it was crazy when that ended up happening. So, yeah, I really wasn't expecting some of these brutal kills that we got. I was expecting brutal kills, but I wasn't expecting them to be as emotional as they were um, and I think they did a really good job with that you know when it comes to Lexi's parents and Michelle as a character is really well written because you, this is not a good person like at all but she feels that she's in the right she's constantly trying to calm everyone down she's constantly trying to diffuse any sort of situations that happen you know any sort of violence that's escalating she tries to like de-escalate it immediately and tells them oh we're a perfect town nothing bad ever happens we have you know we're so well protected you you can just see that everyone like just feels it's bullshit like nobody is buying into what she's doing at all they're just kind of going along with it because they want to have that faith in her but I think it's getting to a point where Michelle just isn't going to be able to do it anymore and I was generally shocked that she did not die at the end of this I thought for sure like she was a goner like when she's setting up that whole event for Frankenstein I'm like you gotta be kidding me, like, this is such an obvious red herring, she's obviously going to die here, and then she doesn't, instead Nathan dies, and I thought that was a really nice spin on things, because now, Michelle's gonna be even more overwhelmed to the point where she has to be that sole parent, but she also is going to feel that guilt for Nathan's death, and I, I'm interested in seeing what they're gonna do um, with her as a character, so again, I felt like even the adult characters were far better written than I expected them to be, and I, I really enjoyed that over all. You know, Devin's mother dying as well. That was another one that just came the fuck out of nowhere for me. Like, when she just, like, falls down the stairs and breaks her neck, I was like, I think she's gonna survive this, probably. And then she broke her neck, and I was like, oh, I guess not. And I think they did what they needed to with that character, though. This was a very naive detective that brought in the wrong suspect, and convinced herself that this was the right person. Even Michelle convinced herself that they brought in the right uh, suspect, even though it wasn't her at all. Um, I thought they did such a great job with that. I like that this science teacher that honestly was one of the only people that gave Jake that respect that he needed and told him, like, I can be this this sort of, you know, um, surrogate mother for you. Um, I thought it was just, it, it was such a good turn for that character, and I think where they're ultimately going to go is that she is going to be, like, the maternal figure in Jake's life moving forward. Now that Bree's dead, now that Logan's dead, I think that's probably what they're going to hint at. I don't know, maybe, maybe Devin or maybe it'll turn out to be she's Devin's, uh, you know, mother figure. I'm not really sure, but I think that's where they're probably headed with that character, and I'm interested in seeing, you know, what they really do with her. Um, but before we get into the finale and the way everything wrapped up, which they did such an amazing job at, at wrapping everything up, I think. I, I was so impressed by so much going on with this finale. I want to get into the legacy characters a bit, because that's the thing that, I gotta be honest, I was a little worried about. I was like, we're not seeing these legacy characters for a while, we get a phone call with Andy in the first episode, and then we don't see them, and I was really worried that we would get to, like, episode 6, and they would just kind of, like, rush through all these stories, but for the most part, I think they did a good job. I will say, there were some storylines I wasn't totally satisfied with. Andy and Kyle, I think, both kind of got the short end of the stick here. Um, Andy as a character, they did some really good work with him in the finale, but prior to that, we don't really see much with him other than, like, the Pulp Fiction style scene of him and Kyle just gunning, go going from house to house and, like, stepping in, being very just, like, diplomatic about it and just killing all these Chucky dolls one by one, um, and then just leaving 
the house without a trace. I mean, it was great. That's one of the best scenes of the entire season, for sure. I, I loved everything about that. It had some great dark comedy. It was awesome to watch. Uh, Alex Vincent and Christina Lee just acted the hell out of that scene. But my biggest issue is that we don't really see a lot when it comes to Andy and Kyle on their own. We get that one scene where Andy kind of drives off without her, but there isn't a lot of interactions between these two characters, and Colt kind of hinted that we would get to see more of their bond. And I'm not a big fan of Child's Play 2, but the one thing I do really like is Kyle as a character. I think she goes from someone that could be really annoying to someone that becomes this genuine sort of, you know, this sister to Andy, and I really enjoyed their relationship, and I don't think we got enough of that here, and that's something I want to see more of, so I'm hoping to God that Kyle is not dead. That, like, please, there's no way Kyle's dead. Like, I know we didn't, I know obviously they said there was a casualty in that bombing, but there's no possible way that Kyle is dead, because I, I just don't think they did nearly enough with this character to make that death even slightly satisfying. So I really hope we get more interactions between those two in season two, because if I had to have a flaw, that's the one thing I think they could have done a better job with here is dive a bit deeper into their overall relationship. But I like what Andy does with Jake and that he is kind of now going on this path where he's kind of controlled by Tiffany. Tiffany is going to be the one that kind of gets into his ear and ha he's kind of forced to like play her game because, you know, he didn't know about Tiffany. He didn't know, you know, the kind of things that she's doing. And I thought overall, you know, they did a really good job when it came to his character at the end. So I assume he's going to have a lot more to do in season two overall. And I'm excited to see where they end up taking this character. But my god, let's get into everything with Tiffany and Nika, because to me, this was expertly crafted. They did such an amazing job with both of these characters. I already talked about sort of the Chucky flashbacks, but I really liked what they did with these flashbacks, where we get to see Chucky from Humble Beginnings, where he's just this kid, but you can tell there's something weird about him. He's enticed by violent things, like just straight up eating a razor blade that has an apple in it. He doesn't really care. Um, he's constantly associating himself with like uh, assailants and things like that, and it eventually gets to a point where he realizes he likes to kill and I love the scene where he's at that foster home and you can see he's trying to do good like he's bonding with these kids it seems like everything's okay but this one guy um ends up pissing him off this janitor's body gets really um just gets really defensive with him and, and really starts to grind his gears to the point where he does kill him and this is what sets him off on that rampage, I thought made a lot of sense. You know, him seeing this assailant and uh, the assailant kind of telling him, like, you got guts, kid, and realizing that's why Chucky always says that. I thought was so good. Like, that's such a good parallel. I love the way they handled that. That's such great character development for Chucky. And even though we might not have gotten a lot every episode I think we got just enough to understand the story here that from the beginning you know Chucky was always into this stuff and I thought they did a really good job with that but also when it came to him and Tiffany's relationship I mean we really get to see this is not necessarily a healthy relationship but something keeps pulling Tiffany back in. She still likes the idea of killing. I think she especially likes the idea of getting attention. That's something that always matters to her. She always wants the spotlight to be on her at all times, and that that's something they dive a lot more into here. I like that we dive more into the fact that she is possessed by, you know, she is um, under the guise of Jennifer Tilly. That's something we have not really gotten to explore, and I hate Seed of Chucky. Like, I don't think it's a good movie at all. Um, but similar to a lot of things, you know, Don Mancini did a lot of good work in trying to make those plot elements convincing, like the idea that Glenn and Glenda are still out there, and one of them's non-binary, one of them, I'm, I'm assuming that they're talking about different people, um, I think one of them's non-binary, and one of them is not, I, I don't know, I'm not sure where they're going with that, I want to see more of Glenn and Glenda, but I like that they reference them overall, um, and then when it came to Tiffany, um, um, you know, I like that they really got into the fact that she is playing this role very convincingly to the point where she is able to trick a junior into thinking that 
uh, she ended up cheating on, you know, that she ended up sleeping with his father, and that he cheated on Brie with Tiffany, and Brie, and Brie killed herself as a result. It's crazy to think about. Like, it really doesn't make much sense in the grand scheme of things, but it's the fact that she was able to pull that off. I mean, we really get some great work with Tiffany, and her relationship with Nika is just so twisted to think about, because you can see that she's kind of using Nika as her puppet at this point and you know whenever Nika turns into Chucky you know full-on killing people and Fiona Durth my god I mean every time she reverts back to uh you know from this very just uncaring and you know uh, wisecracking Chucky who just kills people mercilessly to the helpless Nika who is trying so hard to be that hero she wants people to see that she's in the right that she's not crazy she wants people to find believe her and yet she can't because she's completely powerless here she doesn't have that agency that she wants it's devastating to watch that play out but I really like what they did with that character where you can see she really is trying to find a way to expose what's going on find a way to turn things around and it just keeps going south for her she doesn't understand you know how monstrous Tiffany really is. I think they really did a great job at showing that that monster within Tiffany because Bride of Chucky and C to Chucky always characterize her in like a comedic manner and it's not like they don't here, but I think here we really dive deeper into the true menace of Tiffany and how she really is just as terrifying as Chucky in a lot of areas, especially when you get to the finale. Oh my God, what they do with her. But like I said, the relation between her and Chucky, I mean, they really showed how unhealthy this was, that there's multiple multiple times where he straight up is willing to kill her. He's willing to just kind of leave her in the dust. And she, for some reason, still feels attached to him in that way. And I thought it was such an interesting way to portray that relationship, seeing that like he was killing without her and this was making her really upset. You know, yeah, it's kind of funny to think about it first, but I think the show did a good job at selling the fact that like, even though Tiffany is drawn to Chucky, it's not exactly a healthy relationship in that way. So I'm interested in seeing what they really end up doing with that. It seems like Tiffany is kind of just like going on her own, but yet she still is very much um, going along with Chucky's plan. So I don't really know what they're uh, going to do with that there. Um, but I think overall, when it came to the legacy characters, they did what they needed to do. They played the part in the story. It really is just Andy and, you know, Andy and Kyle's uh, relationship as brother and sister that I don't think they dive quite as deep into, but Nika and Tiffany, I mean, rock solid stuff there. The introduction scene, especially where you have that guy and he's tied up and Nika tries to free him and then reverts back to Chucky and just, uh, kills him right then and there. I mean, just such an amazing scene, the way that whole thing played out, and Fiona Durif really just acted the hell out of this entire show. The fact that she also played Charles Lee Ray in, like, the present day, in, like, the flashbacks in the 80s, is insane to me. I mean, obviously, yeah, Brad Durif and uh, Jennifer Tilly were doing the voices at that point, but... I was just so blown away by her acting ability. I knew that she was good. I didn't know she was this good. And she is just absolutely incredible throughout this entire season. I, I loved what uh, she ended up doing here. And I really like what they do with both of those characters overall. But now let's get deeper into this finale, because this was truly, I mean, the most insane type of finale that they could have come up with, whether it's like the million of Chucky dolls and Chucky, you know, uh, we get some really good interplay like we did in Colt, but I think even more so here we get to see a little bit more where he's like straight up forming this army and there, some of them are, are against what he's doing, some of them are for what he's doing, some of them aren't as intelligent as they can be, and I, I thought that was really interesting the way they go about that. I thought it was just just as entertaining here, and I hope we get to see more of that in season two, which I'm sure we're going to, the, especially the fact that there is this whole tr ass truck that has like 75 good guy dolls, and they're about to like take over the entire population. I think we're getting into some really crazy shit here. It's like Little Shop of Horrors or something like that, so I'm excited to see what they end up uh, doing there, but the theater scene especially was just jaw-dropping in terms of how far they really went with this. I mean, having all of these Chucky dolls just invade the theater and stabbing people underneath their seats and like I said Nathan being the one that dies was just really crazy to think about but then all of these other crazy things happening where 
you know, you have Junior and he's at a point where he wants to kill Lexi. He's he's okay with doing it. He's completely just too far gone at this point. And I, I thought that's what was going to happen. I thought Lexi was going to die there. And I, I wouldn't have been okay with it. Like, I, I would have wanted to see more from that character. But I think they did enough good work with her this season to show her insecurities and to show her sort of learning to be a better person and figuring out and you know figuring out the error of her ways that I think it would have been an okay death but I like the fact that he doesn't do it Lexi's the one that's able to convince him to not turn out this way that he wasn't this way that she did have this genuine love for him and not only does she convince him she also convinced him that he himself is a monster and I loved Frankenstein the background such a good analogy there where you can see that Junior himself feels that he's kind of turning into that and when he steps stabs Chucky and then stabs himself. It, it was just such a good moment. It was so great to watch play out. It was devastating to watch for that character, but I really liked that they took him in that direction because, again, it just made so much sense where they went with uh, Junior this season. I didn't expect him to go in this more villainous direction, but I like that by the end of the show, you know, I, I like that by the end of the season, he realizes the error of his ways and kills himself because of it. It was tragic to watch play out but it was a very good moment for sure that I do think overall uh, worked out very well so I, I thought they did a good job with that the best one of the best moments of the finale for me though is Jake finally standing up to Chucky and you know he does it early on in the season where he kind of tells Chucky I'm not like you I'm a hero I'm not gonna kill Lexi I thought that was an amazing moment but in the finale, when he just starts wailing on Chucky, and he basically tells him that, like, you know, these people didn't have to die, that, you know, he could have made amends with them, he could have turned things around with them, it's just such a good moment for Jake, going from someone that is enticed by the idea of killing to someone that is completely against it by the end of the season. It's a really great arc for his character, and I really like the heroic direction he's going in. He's kind of like a pseudo-Andy in that way, where now he's gonna be the one to you go after these Chucky dolls, but I feel like with Jake, he's trying to get on with his life. Like, that's what he wants to focus on. He wants to focus on Devin. He wants to focus on his, you know, he, he wants to focus on his real life, and obviously that's not going to happen with what's going on. I mean, they are far from over in terms of problems, um, and I think while it's really satisfying to see him completely demolish that Chucky doll, um, obviously there's a lot more going on here, and I don't really know what they're going to do with uh, with Jake moving forward. I think that's something that's going to be interesting because Dami Ancini said, like, we're still focusing on these characters, which I'm happy about. I just don't really know where we're going with them uh, at the end of this season. What was most surprising to me is what they do to poor Nika here. Oh, my God. I mean, I get it that Nika, when uh, she's in... Um, the form of Chucky, and Chucky takes over her, you know, she gets really violent, she gets really erratic, she straight up tries to kill Tiffany at one point, and Tiffany is so fearful of what Chucky's going to do, but I did not expect Tiffany to full-on, like, chop all of Nika's limbs off. I mean, obviously, this is already a paraplegic woman, so she, you know, can't do much with her legs in that way, but to completely chop her, her limbs off in that way, I mean, just... This character got such a raw deal, and in some ways, yeah, it might seem a bit disrespectful to the character, but I think they did enough good work to show that it makes sense why Tiffany would do this. They show early on the season that a way that Tiffany can tell that, um, you know, Ch Nika is not in uh, acting as Chucky is when her legs don't feel any pain, and you can see this is something that really gets to Tiffany when Chucky does threaten to kill her, and now Nina has no limbs, and I, I don't know what they're gonna do with her. She's, like, in this vegetable state now, and if she, you know, obviously she still wants to try to turn things around. She still wants to alert people as to what's going on. I don't know how she gets out of this. I really don't, and I, I'm not sure what they're gonna end up doing with her there, but that was just, that was insane. I was not expecting them to go in that direction, and then, like I said with Andy, uh, it seems like now Tiffany's kind of, like, in control of him. You know, he wanted to redirect the truck 
back, but he came in contact with the Tiffany doll, which was such a great moment. I love that she, uh, it's, there's still a Tiffany doll out there that's like controlling him. Uh, I'm interested in seeing where they really do go with that. So I think there's a lot of unexpected directions, um, even in this finale, and I'm not really sure what they're going to do. But at this point, I trust Don Mancini enough. I trust these writers. They're going in the direction that they want to, and I really am excited to see what they end up doing moving forward. There's a lot of uncertainty with where what's going to happen throughout the rest of the show, aside from those Chucky dolls that are still out there, aside from a bunch of characters still being alive. Um, I do have a prediction, and I think Michelle's going to die. I do think Michelle's probably going to die next season because she's really the only parental character to not bite the dust, which I think is interesting. Um, or they're going to keep her alive. I'm not really sure what they're going to do there, but I guess we'll just have to see what ends up happening when it comes to that character. But overall, I, like I said, there's a lot of stuff I'm not sure how it's going to play out, but I am very much on board to see what ends up happening. Overall, guys, Chucky really did blow me away in more ways than I really ever could imagine. It's a lot of fun to watch, and it does have some really great nostalgia and legacy characters uh, throughout it, and a lot of clever references, I'm sure. A lot of people are really going to get behind, as well as filling in the gap of Chucky as a character, making him feel more fleshed out than he really ever has before. But it also does a really great job of building all of these characters and giving you a reason to care and seeing how this situation, you know, really does hurt them in that way, feeling connected to these characters and putting just as much of a focus on them as it does the action, as it does the horror. Uh, that really makes for such a fulfilling watch overall. It's fun to watch, but it also has this emotional core to it that I really wasn't expecting. It goes in so many different directions and really does feel like the project that Don Mancini has has always wanted to do. The directions he takes these characters in are just absolutely incredible to watch, and I can't wait to see what he really does moving forward. And as I said before, I think this is absolutely where he needs to take the Chucky character. I think above everything, like, if he continues to do the movies, great, but I really want to see more like this, because this really does feel like everything that we've always wanted when it comes to Chucky. This is everything that you could have wanted out of something like this, and I just am really impressed by what Mancini was able to accomplish here when he is working to his full potential. This is without a doubt one of the best of its kind. There are not many horror shows like this out there, and I really just love what he was able to accomplish within the show. And it's amazing to me how a property like Chucky that has been around for so long still is finding creative and different things to do with this character. While you have a franchise like Halloween that really just feels like it's gotten past the point that, you know, it really has just gotten so stale to the point where you wonder why it's even continuing. Here, it's the complete opposite. And I think what really does separate is that, again, you still have that same creator in control. It's been his vision through and through. He always has ideas for these characters, and for the most part, all of them really do, um, you know, pay off in a very satisfying manner here. It doesn't always do a great job of paying tribute to every single character. It doesn't give every single character the most satisfying wrap-up, but overall, I think the show did more than enough to really just... Uh, be one of the best uh, in its genre and overall be one of my favorite shows of the entire year. And so I am overall going to give the first season of Chucky an A. But over, guys, to my review, the first season of Chucky. Let me know what you guys saw this first season overall. Left your thoughts in it. Sorry that this review is a bit delayed, as I said, but I'm glad that I was able to finally get this video done. I hope to have some more TV seasons reviewed in the next couple days. We'll have to see what really does happen there. But that's it for this video. Hope you guys enjoyed it. We'll see you guys in my next video, and we'll see you guys for that. Okay, bye.